Hello, today we're going to discuss angular momentum. Angular momentum is very similar to linear momentum in the fact that it is rotational inertia in motion and not just regular inertia in motion. Recall that our equation for linear momentum was P equals MV. And the P didn't make any sense as a unit for momentum. So now we're going to have another letter that makes no sense for momentum. And that's going to be the letter L. Okay, so L is our variable for angular momentum. Okay, Recall that our angular analog for mass is I, because it is rotational inertia and not just regular inertia. And our rotational analog for V is omega. Okay, so our equation looks very similar to that of linear momentum, except it's just dealing with angular quantities. The one thing that is different, though, is going to be our units. Okay, if you look at L equals I omega, we measure I in kilograms meters squared, and omega is in radians per second. Remember that we multiply radians by anything that kind of disappears. So the units we're left with for angular momentum are kilograms meters squared per second. Okay, so when you see kilograms meters squared per second, that is our unit for angular momentum. Just as we had impulse when there was a change in the linear momentum due to an outside force, remember that impulse J was equal to delta P, which is equal to force times time. Okay, we're not going to have a special uh, no letter to represent angular impulse, but we are going to say that the change in the angular momentum is going to equal to, now instead of a force times time, it's going to be torque times time. So two different t's there, a tau and a t, but that is torque times time. So whenever you have an outside torque applied for any given period of time, there will be a change in the object's angular momentum. Just as we had conservation of linear momentum, we will have conservation of angular momentum. And yet again, the key is going to be the fact that it is an isolated system. Okay, so no outside forces, or in this case, torques, acting on our system. Okay, the most common example of this is the classic figure skater question. Okay, when the figure skater has her arms out wide, she has now distributed her mass all the way through her arms here. Okay, and so her I value is some value. Okay, when she brings her arms in, now all of her mass is located in the center. Okay, so her I value has decreased. Okay, so I has decreased. Okay, there is no external torque acting on her. Okay, there's just an internal torque where she's applying that force within her body to pull her arms in. And so because there is no external torque, angular momentum will be conserved. Okay, so we're going to set up just like we did for linear momentum and say the initial momentum equal to final momentum. All right, in this case, we're only looking at one object though. So we're going to say I naught times omega naught will equal I F times omega F. Okay, and so if I goes down, that means omega goes up. That's what you've seen if you've ever watched figure skating. One of my personal favorites. Uh, you know, pull the arms in, they start spinning much faster. Just great. Love me, love me some figure skating. Oh man, can't get enough. Okay, if you have a collision. Angular momentum will still be conserved depending on how you define your system. So in this case, our system will be you know, these two plates right here. Now they're separate, the first part, and then they are together here. Still, that's, that's our system. Okay, so there's no outside forces acting on it. And so in this case, we would have, again, a conservation of momentum system. But now we have multiple objects. So it'd be like I1 naught, omega 1 naught, plus I2 naught, omega 2 naught. And because this is an inelastic collision, we would have these two together at the end times omega f. Okay, so a very common, another example would be that conservation of angular momentum for two different objects. And usually you have plates, you have like a clay blob falling on a, a plate that's already spinning or something, something along those lines. So again, momentum is conserved. Okay. If you have a linear object, let's move this up here. I don't know why I put it so far down there. It still can have 
angular momentum. I know that sounds very counterintuitive, but we're going to see on the next page why this is. Okay, well, let's say we have a reference point. We'll just make our reference point this star right here. Okay, and let's say that our object is traveling linearly at a speed v this way. Okay, and we want to determine what the angular momentum of this object is. And again, you're going, why is there angular momentum of an object that is traveling linearly? The best, one of the good examples of this is our planets and planetary motion. Okay, we'll talk about that here in a second. But when objects are traveling linearly, they still will have angular momentum. Okay, because if they were to encounter an object, which we'll see on the next slide, there could be a resulting kind of spin to an object after a collision. Okay, so if our object here, we're going to call this mass m, traveling at a speed v, Okay, and the distance we're looking at is a distance that's again perpendicular. Remember that's kind of our, our big thing here, okay? Where we have these perpendicular distances. If we think of it in terms of the equation we just saw, I times omega, we know that I for a point mass is m r squared, and omega is equal to v over r. Okay, that's just our basic relationship going from linear to angular. And if you notice, one of your r's will cancel out, and you're left with an equation that L equals M times V times R, where V and R are in fact perpendicular to each other. Okay. Um, sometimes you'll see this as a lowercase m, that they'll use a lowercase m for an object that is not rotating, but you can also see it as capital L as well, sorry. So capital L or lowercase L, not M, I don't know what I was thinking there. All right, so there is the angular momentum of a linearly moving object. Let's see where this applies, okay? So if we have an, a collision that involves rotation and translation. So these are both top views, okay? So let's say we're looking down on some kind of stick maybe that's laying on ice, and this is a puck that's sliding into the ice. When you have this kind of collision where the ball is traveling linearly, okay, it's going to strike a point on the stick. Okay, there's a center mass of the stick. What's going to happen is after the collision, the stick will be moving with two different kinds of velocities. It will have a linear velocity where the center of mass is traveling in a straight line. And it also will have some angular velocity where it is rotating. Okay? Our ball may be moving, probably moving backwards at some point. Let's just put that on there so it's moving backwards. Okay? So after it rebounds, okay, the, the stick goes from being stationary to now both moving linearly and rotationally. Okay? So it does have rotational angular momentum after the collision. Well, we know momentum is conserved and it can't be created in a closed system. And our closed system here is our stick and our ball. So this ball does have to have angular momentum before the collision. So when we have this kind of collision, we have both linear and angular momentum being conserved. Okay, so P naught will equal PF in our system, and L naught equals LF in our system. Okay? So when we look at this, this is just gonna be our traditional momentum. So you know M1 V1 naught plus M2 V2 naught equals M1 V1 F plus M2 V2 F. And if it was an inelastic collision, of course these would be traveling at the same speed. Be a little bit easier calculation. Okay, same idea over here for our angular momentum. Okay, we're gonna have, we'll do this in blue, I1 naught omega 1 naught plus I2 naught omega 2 naught equals I1 F omega 1 F plus I2 F omega 2 F. Okay, so the reason we have initial and final angular momentums is the fact that those can change. They probably won't in a collision problem, but just to keep those uh, in mind here. Okay, so we have our mass m traveling at a speed v naught. The r value again is going to be the distance from the axis of rotation to the direction of motion that are perpendicular to each other. Okay, so our r value here would be the distance from where on the stick it's going to rotate about which is at its center. Okay, the center of mass is where it's going to rotate. If this ball were to stick, our center of mass would change, and then we would have a different R value. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So on the problem, we would say M1 times V1 naught times R equals, for this case, 
Uh, the rod being rotated about its center, the I value is one third mass of the rod times length of the rod squared times omega of the rod, final, plus the mass that's moving times its final velocity times R again. Okay? So in this case, our R value would still be the same, more than likely, okay? because our R here is again going to be that perpendicular distance between the line of motion and the distance about or the place at which the object is rotating. Okay? One last thing we'll look at real quick, and that is objects that are traveling in elliptical orbits. Okay? And these also travel and follow the rules of conservation of angular momentum. So pardon the drawings here. But if we have an object that's traveling around the sun, okay, objects that are closer to the sun travel faster than those that are further away. Okay? This is one of Kepler's laws of planetary motion. And one way we can look at this is do the conservation of angular momentum, where it has as much angular momentum here as it does here. Okay? But what's changing about our planet that's traveling in an ellipse? Okay? That would be the R value. Okay? So if we have M times V0 times R0, will equal M times VF times RF. And again, using this equation, because we're looking at a point mass traveling, okay, our R value initially is here. Our R value after some time has changed is here. Okay, so as you can see, the R value is much greater, therefore the V is going to be less. Okay, so just something to keep in mind that we can look at planetary motion in terms of angular momentum as well. Thanks!